please? <clears throat> good evening, good evening, everyone. Well, tonight we're going to continue our study in the book of Jeremiah. Let's open up our Bibles to Jeremiah 49. You see me kind of looking down a lot tonight. My eyes are feeling kind of sensitive to the light. Once in a while, my eyes feel that way. So it's what happens when you get old and you wear glasses and you've got all this magnification going on in your eyes and figured I would sit down just in case I collapse or something. So that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Just to watch me collapse on stage during the teaching. <clears throat> Some people might think I was slain in the spirit or something. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. You guys wouldn't think that, but some watching might. I really appreciate Jonathan reading from uh, Psalm 26 uh, to begin the worship time, especially that verse that says, Oh, Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not take my soul away along with sinners, nor my life with men of bloodshed. Um, that's my prayer in my life a lot. Those are a couple of verses that I like to quote while I'm in prayer. I want nothing to do with the fate of the wicked. I love the habitation of God's house. I love church. I love my Bible. I love Jesus. I love God's people. <clears throat> I love being a Christian. I love the life of a Christian. I love walking with God. I love being obedient to God. I love God. I love everything about God. I love everything he's given me. And I don't want anything to do with the garbage of this world, the, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I struggle with it, of course. It, it's something that I wrestle with. But if you're comfortable in the world tonight, if you're comfortable living in sin, if you're comfortable with not going to church, if you're comfortable with not reading your Bible, if you're comfortable with disobeying God, you're in a bad place. You're in a bad place and you need to repent. You need to turn to the Lord tonight. You need to ask God to forgive you of your sins. You need to ask the Lord to cleanse you of your unrighteousness. You need to ask the Lord to give you a new heart, a heart that loves him, a heart that wants to serve him. That's what you need tonight. Because the fate of the wicked is destitute. It's horrible. It's not only horrible in the afterlife, but it's horrible in this life too. There's a, there's a measure of grace, even though Christians suffer, we go through things, sometimes physically, we go through, th through things spiritually, we, we go through trials. We face the same trials the rest of the world faces. But the difference is, is we have God's blessing on our lives. And that's huge. That's everything. That means I'm always in the palm of his hand. That means if something happens to me, he's there with me. He's holding me in the palm of his hand. I'm the apple of his eye. He's, he's when something happens to me and I feel like things are out of control, he's in control. He's there walking with me, putting the right people in my path. And when you're a non-believer or when you're just disobedient to God even as a believer, some of those protections are not afforded you. You lose some of that. We don't want that. Shouldn't want that. So read Psalm 26 on your own and meditate on it for a long time. A long time. Let it sink in. Okay? Jeremiah chapter 49. Let's turn there. How about if I turn there since I already told you to and you're probably already there. Jeremiah 49. Chapter 49 is a continuation of a long section consisting of prophecies of judgment against a variety of Gentile nations. Jeremiah 49 gives us the details of several nations that God is going to judge. Before we take a look, let's pray. Shouldn't be surprised about what we're about to read because it's been the same thing for a number of weeks. <clears throat> but there are still lessons to be learned. 
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for tonight, for bringing us here, God, and, and placing us in this nice air-conditioned room, in the comfort of the seating that we have, in this kind of a climate, Lord, where our attention can be fixed on you. As Jonathan prayed earlier, Lord, that we wouldn't wander. <laughs> we have <clears throat> enough creature comforts in this room to keep us from doing that. But Lord, we want to hear what you have to say to us through the proxy of what you said to a number of other nations thousands of years ago. And Lord, we want to learn. We want to understand we want to digest these truths and we want these truths to become the very fabric of our being. We want to live our lives in such a way, Lord, that they please you. So Lord, we thank you for these examples from history as we continue to go through these verse by verse and look at the very uh, meticulous way in which you described what you were going to do to these nations. Lord, let us take heed tonight and let us be humbled tonight and also encouraged tonight. Lord, speak to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Jeremiah 49. Look at the first part of verse 1. Concerning the sons of Ammon. Now before we read on, let me just give you a little bit of info about <clears throat> the Ammonites. The Ammonites were the descendants of Lot's youngest daughter. Remember, we're talking about the incestuous relationship between Lot's daughter and himself. <laughs> Very sad situation there. Another story for another time. <clears throat> but... The Ammonites were the descendants of Lot's youngest daughter. They were the neighbors of Israel. They were located east of the Jordan River and yet north of Moab. The Ammonites had seasons of being hostile to Israel and were oftentimes in, leagues, in league with other nations against Israel, such as Moab, Amalek, the Syrians, and even other nations, and they were almost always hostile both before and after the captivity until eventually they were swallowed up by the Roman Empire. I did read an interesting quote, at least I thought this was an interesting quote, from Unger's Bible Dictionary. It says, in the time of Justin Martyr, which was about 150 AD, the Ammonites were quite numerous. But in the time of origin, they were merged with the Arabs. Interesting little tidbit. Now, we're going to learn more about them as we work through the details of the first part of chapter 49. During this period of time, the Ammonites were allied with Judah against Babylon during Judah's final revolt the judgment against Ammon begins with a series of questions. Look back at verse 1. Concerning the sons of Ammon, thus says the Lord, Does Israel have no sons? Or has he no heirs? Why then has Malcolm taken possession of Gad and his people settled in its cities? Now what these questions do is they expose the problem of Ammon and why their judgment is imminent. The first reason would fall, or the first reason the judgment would, would fall was because the, be the people were guilty of idolatry and oppressing God's people. Now a quick history lesson behind what is being said there in verse 1. 
when Assyria conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and exiled its citizens, the Ammonites immediately moved in and took control of some of the land and claimed it as theirs. What they did then was they gave their false god, Malcolm. By the way, Malcolm is also known as Molech. It had several different names. I'm going to use the word Molech because I think most of you are probably familiar with that word. <clears throat> but they, they gave their false god, Molech, credit for giving them the land. But there was a problem with their claim. Centuries earlier, the Lord had promised the land to Israel, in particular to the tribe of Gad. And although Assyria had exiled the citizens of Gad, the Lord had promised that they would return to their homeland. So this was the background of the questions that God is asking here of the Ammonites. Did Israel have no sons or heirs to return to inherit their land? Why were the Ammonites claiming that their god Molech had taken possession of the land and had given it to them as a gift? Why were the Ammonites living in towns that belonged to the tribe of Gad? These penetrating questions posed two, or rather exposed, two of the major sins of the Ammonites, and that is, as I mentioned earlier, the sins of idolatry and the sin of oppressing God's people. Consequently, they would face God's judgment because they worshiped the false God and they persecuted the people of the Lord, the only true and living God. And they were well aware of the God of the Israelites. After all, Lot... <clears throat> their, <laughs> from, from whom their seed came, Lot knew who Jehovah was. In fact, you can barely tell it from reading the Genesis account, for from 2 Peter's account, <clears throat> from 2 Peter, we understand that Lot was actually a righteous man. As weak as his righteousness may have been, he was a righteous man. So they were well aware of Yahweh. So the Lord continues, verse 2. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that I will cause a trumpet blast of war to be heard against Rabbah of the sons of Ammon, and it will become a desolate heap, and her towns will be set on fire. Then Israel will take possession of his possessors, says the Lord. Wail, O Heshbon, for Ai, I think that's pronounced Ai, has been destroyed. Cry out, O daughters of Rabbah, Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament and rush back and forth inside the walls for Malcolm or uh, Molech <clears throat> will go into exile together with his priests and his princes. So the Lord declared that one day he would sound the battle cry against their capital, which going back to verse two was Rabbah and the nearby towns of Rabbah, they would be set on fire and would become nothing but mounds of ruin. The land would be returned to the rightful heirs, the Israelites to whom God had promised it. Because of the sins of idolatry and oppression, the major cities that are mentioned there in verse three, Heshbon and Ai, these major cities would be destroyed. The people would weep and wail as they suffered their just punishment and they would be exiled right along with their as it says there in the tail end of verse 3 along with their false god and priests so this false god Molech would be totally unable to come to their rescue and God would show as he does time and time again that he alone is God and there is no other God but him he continues in verse 4. How boastful you are about the valleys. Your valley is flowing away, O backsliding daughter who trusts in her treasures, saying, Who will come against me? Behold, I'm going to bring terror upon you, declares the Lord of hosts, from all directions around you. And each of you will be driven out headlong with no one to gather the fugitives together. So here, the Lord is rebuking them. Apparently, they felt secure because they were trusting in their wealth and their military power. 
Now, Ammon was a well-protected country. It was difficult to get to because mountain ranges surrounded its territory on three sides. Below the mountain, range, mountain ranges were two major rivers, the Arnon River and the Jabbok, which made the soil of the nation's valley very fertile. Because of its location and its rich farmland, Ammon had a very strong economy and was a wealthy nation. Trusting in their wealth and military power, the people were self-sufficient and they felt very secure. They were, very material, they were a very materialistic society, one that showed no interest in or need for the Lord. And so consequently, they were going to face God's judgment. The Lord announced that he was going to use the surrounding nations as his agents to judge Ammon. The Ammonites would be driven out of the land that God had promised to Israel. They would have no leader who would gather the fugitives together. They were going to be scattered. But, look at verse 6. But afterward, I will restore the fortunes of Ammon, the sons of Ammon, excuse me, declares the Lord. So again, similar to Egypt and Moab, the message against Ammon ends in a hopeful word. Apparently, they're going to be the recipients of the Lord's blessing again during the time of the earthly reign of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see that phrase is going to come up again where another nation is going to be the recipients of this blessing. But this is a long way off from this time period. <clears throat> Ammon, as was known back then, where is it today? It's been assimilated. It's nowhere. For right now, the, it doesn't exist as a land, at least not as Ammon. Now, beginning at verse 7, let's move on to verse 7. Now we're going to see a prophecy against the nation of Edom. It begins, concerning Edom. Now let's stop right there. If you didn't already know this, the Edomites were Israel's neighbors to the south. They were the descendants of Esau, Jacob's older brother. Esau's descendants took up the land of the south and eventually formed into a dynastic reign of eight kings. And you can read what their names were in Genesis chapter 36. In fact, it says in Genesis 36, 31, these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. So this was prior to Israel having any leader over them. The Edomites already had a king. Later on, we... You might recall that the Edomites refused to permit the Israelites to pass through their land. Remember they, when they were coming up from the wilderness wandering, they came up through the land, they were trying to make their way around on the, you have to think about this for a second, the east side of the, of the Jordan, east side of the Dead Sea actually, uh, trying to get to a route known as the King's Highway, major trade route that connected the north to the south. The Edomites said, uh-uh, you're not coming through here. Well, you may recall that Esau had very bitter hatred toward his brother Jacob. And down through the centuries, the Edomites were filled with bitter hatred for Israel and did everything they could to oppress and show their hostility to the descendants of Jacob. But now, according to the prophecy we're about to read, the Edomites were going to, to, were going to suffer along with everyone else under the scourge of the Babylonian war machine. Let's pick it up with the rest of verse 7. Concerning Edom, thus says the Lord of hosts, Is there no longer any wisdom in Teman? Has good counsel been lost to the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Flee away, turn back. Dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the disaster of es Esau upon him at the time I will punish him. 
If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? If thieves came by night, they would destroy only until they had enough. But I have stripped Esau bare. I have uncovered his hiding places so that he will not be able to conceal himself. His offspring has been destroyed along with his relatives and his neighbors, and he is no more. Leave your orphans behind. I will keep them alive and let your widows trust in me. Let's back up to verse 7. The prophecy begins with this question, is there no longer any wisdom in Teman? Has good counsel been lost to the prudent? Has their wisdom decayed? Well, Teman was a chief district in northern Edom. So the question is being asked about whether or not there's any wisdom left in Teman. Why would that question be asked of the inhabitants of Teman? Well, Teman was apparently renowned for its wisdom. You may recall uh, Eliphaz, one of Job's counselors, was from Teman. Remember, if, well, you may not remember, but way back when, when we were in the book of Job, <clears throat> we, we talked about Eliphaz a little bit and, and just sort of talked about, uh, hypothesized about the the idea that perhaps Eliphaz in coming to Job would have been able to bring this vast storehouse of wisdom to enlighten Job. Of course, none of them really had anything very constructive to say to Job. But apparently Teman was a, a, a place that was renowned for its wisdom. And so the question from Yahweh is meant to challenge this alleged wisdom. Could they not understand that destruction was imminent? And then in verse 8, Dedan was a city of northern Arabia. And apparently some people from Dedan were in Edom at this time. And they're being advised to flee and hide. They were warned to disassoci disassociate themselves from Edom as quickly as possible lest they be caught up in Edom's coming disaster. And so here all of this activity is going on of what God is getting ready to do. All of this stirring is going on. And you may even recall that the prophet Obadiah, Obadiah was sent to prophesy to Edom. And there are a number of similarities between the prophecies here and of the prophecies in Obadiah. For example, verses 9 and 10 that we just read actually correspond with Obadiah verses 5 and 6. There's only one chapter in Obadiah. <clears throat> Showing that this judgment would be more thorough, as it says there, than grape pickers who at least leave a few grapes on the vine when they're done. And also that God's judgment, judge, God's judgment would be more thorough than thieves who during the night only are going to steal as much as they can carry. In other words, they're going to leave something behind. A thief can't steal, for example, all your furniture in your living room, right? They, couldn't, they couldn't, wouldn't have the means to carry it away. At least most wouldn't that are breaking in. If a thief... If a thief leaves something behind, the Lord is saying here, that may be the case. The grape gleaners may leave grapes behind, but God is saying to Edom, I am going to strip Edom bare. I'm not going to leave anything behind. And yet there's this little comment in verse 11 that in spite of this thorough judgment that is coming to them, the helpless orphans and widows would be spared by God. Now what this shows is that God's judgments are very measured and they're not haphazard. Even though Edom is being told, I'm basically going to clean you out. Yet, 
I'm not going to overlook mercy where mercy should be given. In other words, it's not just willy-nilly judgment. Sometimes we think that about God. We, we hear about a hurricane hitting somewhere. And we hear about hundreds or thousands of lives being lost. And we, weather, and we wonder whether or not God has concern for small, the small details. In other words, does God just wave his hand of judgment across the land and just wipe it all out with no consideration about the individual people who might happen to live in that land? Well, we know that God cares for the sparrow that falls, Jesus said, the sparrow that dies. The hair, the very hairs on our head are numbered. Now, God is aware of every individual that may lose a life and every individual who may not. He, he, he's intimately knowledgeable of every aspect of every life. Even, even the lives we never learn anything about, like the life of a baby who's aborted right? The Lord knows that life too. He's numbered every, every little part of that body in the womb. Even before all the parts are formed, they're still numbered. God knows who they are. So I find this to be a very interesting insertion there in verse 11. But he's not done with Edom yet. Verse 12. For thus says the Lord, behold those who were not sentenced to drink the cup will certainly drink it. And are you the one who will be completely acquitted? He asks. You will not be acquitted, but you will certainly drink it. So here the Lord is saying that Edom had to be judged because of her many crimes, because of her many sins. And the question is asked that if God made those who do not deserve to drink the cup of his wrath, well, who would this be? Well, those nations who perhaps were unrelated to Judah, the, the nations who never boasted in her fall. If God made those nations who do not deserve to drink the cup of his wrath drink it, then how could a nation with close fraternal ties such as Edom's, how could that nation expect to go unpunished? You see, there were some nations who didn't delight in the fall of Judah, in the trouble that was coming to Judah. But Edom did. And Edom is now being told, do you think you're going to escape judgment? Because your sins actually are greater than the sins of some of the nations around you. And so if nations unrelated to Judah were to be punished for their mistreatment of her, think about the nations that were so closely related to Judah, how much greater condemnation they would deserve. I mean, in a sense, Edom was related to Israel, right? By blood. And yet... Edom seemed to be so antagonistic toward her brother, if you will. The Lord continues in verse 13. For I have sworn by myself, declares the Lord, that Basra will become an object, object of horror, a reproach, a ruin, and a curse, and all its cities will become perpetual ruins. Basra is being referred to here because it was the capital of Edom at this time. So this shows that the very heart of Edom is in God's crosshairs. 14 and 15. I have heard a message from the Lord and an envoy is, is sent among the nations saying, gather yourselves together and come against her and rise up for battle. For behold, I have made you small among the nations, despised among men. So in other words, the Lord himself was going to rally together armies to come against Edom. God would reduce Edom's prestige and power among the nations and the Edomites would be despised among men. A reputation that was at one time good 
was now going to be destroyed. Verse 16. As for the terror of you, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you, O you who live in the clefts of the rock, who occupy the height of the hill, though you make your nest as high as an eagle's, I will bring you down from there, declares the Lord. Now this is repeated in the book of Obadiah, basically this, that verse right there. The people needed to know that their sense of security was false. Their pride in their impregnable defenses and military power was a false pride. It was a false confidence. And their sense of security was a deception. Does our dear friend Donald Trump actually think he's going to make America great again without a calling to turn to God to repent of our sins? Can America possibly be great just because it has economic status in the world, because it has a great military power? Is that all there is to making America great? Is the fact that we can trample over China or Russia, is the fact that we have great trade agreements between these nations, is that really the thing that's going to make us great again? Can we actually be great when we are a nation that wants to take God out of everything? Will God really allow us to just carry on with the kind of prestige and world domination that we've enjoyed now for so many decades? Is the Lord really just going to let us continue on our little march as a superpower without a turning to him, without an acknowledging, Lord, we're great because of you? Of course not. It's not possible. Continuing on. Verse 17, Edom will become an object of horror. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss at all its sounds. Like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah with its neighbors, says the Lord, no one will live there, nor will a son of man reside in it. What he's basically saying there in verse 18 is their ruin was going to be irreversible. This was going to be a final blow that was going to bring Edom as we know it down permanently. Verse 19. Behold, one will come up like a lion from the thickets of the Jordan against a perennially, perennially watered pasture. For in an instant I will make him run away from it, and whoever is chosen, chosen excuse me, I shall appoint over it, for who is like me? And who will summon me into court? And who then is the shepherd who can stand against me? In other words, if God, if this all happens... Who, who's going to call God into account? Who's going to bring God into a courtroom? And who is it going to be? Who are the jury? That, who's the jury and judge that's going to call God into account? And who is the shepherd that's going to stand against me? Who is going to protect these people? Who can protect something that God is coming after? And the answer to these questions is, well, no one. No one can. <laughs> and no one should want to. Because if God's coming after them, there's a just cause. So someone who'd be trying to stand in the way of that would be standing in the way of what's right. Because God is a God of truth. Verse 20. Therefore, hear the plan of the Lord, which he has planned against Edom and his purposes, which he has purposed against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely they will drag them off, even the little ones of the flock. Surely he will make their pasture desolate because of them. The earth has quaked at the noise of their downfall. There is an outcry. 
The noise of it has been heard at the Red Sea. Behold, he will mount up and swoop like an eagle and spread out his wings against Basra and the hearts of the mighty men of Edom in that day will be like the heart of a woman in labor. In other words, they're just, they're gonna come unglued. They're gonna be in so much pain. <clears throat> the language here is letting us know that God's judgment is gonna be unsettling. We know, right, that God's judgment can shake us to the core of our being. I mean, just a good storm causes everybody to run inside. If, remember that one time, was anybody here on that Wednesday night when it, it, there was a storm and there was a thunderclap in the back of the church while I was teaching? It was so loud. Remember that? So I see one head shaking. It rocked this building like nothing else I've ever seen. And I remember thinking that lightning had to strike like right behind the church. The Lord can shake any human being to the core of their being, anyone, at a moment's notice. Now, of course, when the Lord shakes, rattles, and rolls particular nations, Edom being one of them, that's some nations collapsing is, gonna, is, is going to catch the attention of the world greater than others, okay? We might hear of a little third world country that goes bankrupt and people might just go, eh. But if a nation like China were to collapse or Russia or the United States or Japan, well, that would be a little more than just a, eh, right? That would, that would cause the world looking on to go, whoa. And that's what's gonna happen with when Edom falls. Verse 23 Concerning Damascus, Hamath and Arpad are put to shame, for they have heard bad news. They are disheartened. There is anxiety by the sea. It cannot be calmed. Damascus has become helpless. She has turned away to flee, and panic has gripped her. Distress and pangs have taken hold of her like a woman in childbirth. How the city of praise has not been deserted, the town of my joy. Therefore, her young men will fall in her streets and all the men of war will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord of hosts. I will set a fire to the wall of Damascus and it will devour the fortified towers of Ben-Hadad. In verse 23, we have Hamath, our pad, or our pod perhaps, and Damascus. These were three major cities of Syria. Here it says that they were dismayed because of the bad news of Babylon's advance. No specific sins are mentioned, but Syria had a bad history of coming against the Israelites as well. It says that Damascus' pain will, was like that of a woman in labor. In Nebuchadnezzar's attack on Damascus, the soldiers of Damascus were silenced. Her fortifications were burned. God vowed to consume, it says in verse 27, the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad was actually the name of the dynasty that ruled in Damascus in the 9th and 8th centuries BC. So here the Lord is targeting judgment on specific cities in Syria, although all of Assyria was going to go into captivity. <clears throat> but these cities were the, were the strong points of Syria. And then look at verse 28. Concerning Kedar and the kingdoms of Hazar, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated. Thus says the Lord, Arise, go up to Kedar, and devastate the men of the east. They will take away their tents and their flocks. They will carry off for themselves their tent curtains, all their goods and their camels, 
and they will call out to one another, terror on every side. Run away, flee, dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Hazor, declares the Lord. For Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has formed a plan against you and devised a scheme against you. Arise, go up against a nation which is at ease, which lives securely, declares the Lord. It has no bars or gates. They dwell alone. Their camels will become plunder and their many cattle for booty and I will scatter to all the winds those who cut the corners of their hair and I will bring their disaster from every side, declares the Lord. And Hazor will become a haunt of jackals, a desolation forever. No one will live there nor will a son of man reside in it. Now, here's an interesting message of judgment to the tribes who were living in the Arabian desert. Going back to verse 28, Kedar was a nomadic tribe of Ishmaelites in the Arabian, in the Arabian desert that was known for her skills in archery, her flocks of sheep, her extensive trade, and her warlike nature. The kingdoms of Hazar, this does not refer to the city of, could be Hazar, may not be Hazar. Uh, the kingdoms of Hazar does not refer to the city of Hazar in Israel that was just north of the Sea of Galilee. Rather, it was some as yet unknown place located in the Arabian desert. These Arabian people apparently felt so secure in their remote desert location that they did not even have <coughs> city gates or bars to protect them against attack. But it says that the inhabitants would be scattered to the winds <coughs> and the city itself would become a haunt of jackals forever, a symbol, as it says there, of desolation. Verse 33. The uh, nomadic tribe, Kadar, because of its archery skills, they felt very, they felt that they were basically untouchable. And the Lord was saying, no, even though you're nomadic, even though you're known as warriors, the Lord says, even in the desert, I'm going to hunt you down, I'm going to track you down. The Babylonians are going to track you down and they're going to wipe you out while well, they already had at this point. And then finally, the very last prophecy, that which came, verse 34, that which came as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet concerning Elam. At the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, sang. Let's stop there for a moment. Now, concerning this prophecy against Elam, According to one source, Elam was one of the earliest civilizations on earth, an ancient nation that probably could trace its roots back to Elam, the son of Shem and grandson of Noah. Elam was located about 200 miles east of Babylon on the eastern side of the Tigris River. It lost its importance as a dominant world power when Assyria conquered the nation somewhere around 640 BC. It regained its independence when Babylon conquered Assyria. Eventually, Edom and Media joined hands to become one nation. Later, the king, of, uh, king Cyrus of Persia defeated Media and Elam and founded the great Medo-Persian Empire that dominated Western Asia from 539 to 331 BC. Interestingly, Jeremiah gave this prophecy early in the reign of King Zedekiah of Judah. This suggests that perhaps God wanted the world of that day to know that Edom would not be able to stop the mighty power of Babylon, God's appointed agent 
to execute justice against the wicked nations of the world. So in other words, even a, native, uh, a nation as old as Elam it would not be exempt from what God was going to do. Uh, God pronounced that his hand of judgment would fall on Edom. And the reason for this is because of Elam's false trust in their military equipment and power. The Edomites were apparently very well known to be highly skilled in the use of the bow and it was the major weapon in their arsenal of military weapons. But notice that God said that he was going to break their bow. God was going to break the bow, which was the backbone of their war machine. God would stir up invaders from every direction to attack Elam. And the Elamites would be conquered and exiled and scattered throughout all the nations of the world. So God's anger would be aroused to such a degree that Edom would be shattered. The people, the people would suffer disaster. They'd be completely destroyed. And so the sword of God's agent of justice and judgment would pursue them until they had made a complete end of the Edomites. Yeah, excuse me, the Elamites. So verse 35, continuing on, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I'm going to break, he says, I'm going to break the bow of Elam, the finest of their might. I'm going to bring upon Edom the four winds from the four ends of heaven and scatter them to these winds. And there will be no nation to which the outcasts of Edom will not go. In other words, that's how far they're going to be scattered. That's how much they're going to be scattered. I will shatter Elam before their enemies and before those who seek their lives, and I will bring calamity upon them, even my fierce anger declares the Lord, and I will send out the sword after them until I have consumed them. Then I'm going to set my throne in Edom, Elam and destroy out of it king and princes, declares the Lord. Some believe that th verse 38 may be a reference <clears throat> to the fact that... Uh, Cyrus uh, and the Medes and Persians that he had set his throne right there in, 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 in Elam and that's where he ruled from during the <clears throat> Persian, Medo-Persian reign. Now, so once again, there's the judgment. What the Lord says he's going to do to Elam. <laughs> but then the very last verse, again, but it will come about in the last days that I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. So, in spite of the harsh, harshness of judgment on Elam, the message closes with a word of hope very similar to the one that was given to Egypt, to Moab, and to Ammon. And so the message of hope here teaches that there are no limits on God's sovereignty. It may include judgment on a nation, and it may include exaltation of that very same nation. But here we see that the collection of messages against several nations in chapter 49 serves to affirm God's universal sovereignty and that all nations are subject to accountability to God, regardless of whether or not they belong to Israel, God was going to hold them accountable. God, of course, we know that God is one day going to bring judgment to the entire earth. The heavens and the earth, which are now, are reserved for fire against the day of judgment. When the Lord Jesus will judge all of the wickedness on the earth, the entire world will fall under his judgment. Sure, there's going to be a remnant, a very small few that will escape that judgment because they will turn to the Lord and seek salvation through Christ. But ultimately, it's God's plan to judge this earth. The world's kingdoms as we see them today 
are going to fall under the judgment of God. Satan, the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, is going to be brought down as well. It's amazing to see all of these various world leaders that we've seen throughout history sort of position themselves as though they think they're going to live forever. It's quite a deception if you think about it. They can look back and see everybody's died. <laughs> I don't know how, why they would think that somehow their kingdom is going to, they're going to rise to this certain elevated state and perhaps live eternally, at least on this earth. They will live eternally, just not on this earth. But no, they're going to be brought down. Every world power eventually will be brought down except the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That kingdom will never come to an end. And the kingdom that we are a part of will never come to an end. So we can rejoice in that. But we can also take heed and know that we only have a little window left to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ right now because the window is... is closing and we don't know how much time we have so there's plenty of loved ones out there that the Lord wants us to witness to there's plenty of neighbors that we have plenty of people that we run across in our day to day lives that the Lord wants us to witness to Paul said I suffer all things for the sake of the elect whatever it takes because I know God has some people out there that he's going to connect me with people that I'm going to share my faith with, I'm going to share the gospel with. And you know what? It, whether I'm just sowing a seed or watering or whether or not I'm actually involved in a harvest, you never know what, what, what role we're playing at, that, at any given moment. But we do know that that door is closing, time is running out, and so that's why we're told to redeem the time because the days are evil. Judgment is coming. Whether it's individual judgment upon individuals or whether it's God's judgment on nations. Judgment is coming. That's what the Lord has told us. We're well aware of it. We understand that. And yet, the encouraging thing to know is that in the midst of, I mean, look what, look what Jeremiah is doing. He's pronouncing for all practical purposes, worldwide judgment, worldwide in his world, and yet God sustains him. God keeps him. He's the mouthpiece of the Lord. And many, many others that were alive during this time, saints, prophets, believers, believers in Yahweh, God was preserving them. They were going to be kept. They were going to be fed. And God did just that. Some of them lost their lives because they spoke the truth. Some of them were taken out. There's a whole list of martyrs. Jesus, even when he was rebuking the Pharisees, mentioned the fact that the children of Israel historically stoned the prophets, wanted many of them dead. There's only a small remnant of people who actually take this book seriously. Oh, there's lots of professors. Just like today, there's lots of professors of Christianity, right? Lots of people say they know the Lord, say they're Christians. But we know, we know, because Jesus told us how narrow that road is and, and how narrow the road is and how few there be that will find that narrow path and walk on that narrow path. Because the message of the gospel isn't, isn't accommodating to the flesh. It's not just come to Jesus and he'll take care of all your problems. There's a cross to bear. <clears throat> There's a life that we give up. In order to follow the Lord, we, we die. We die to ourselves so that we might follow him. And for many, that's just too much to deal with. It's too much to give up. So they'll live for the temporal pleasures of this life and they'll suffer eternally. But for them, living the pleasures, for many, the living the pleasure of this, pleasures of this life is, is, 
is all they want because the God of this world has blinded their eyes, made them blind and dulled their senses so that they can't see beyond the, the temporal. They can't see the eternal. So those of us whose eyes God has opened, whose hearts God has opened, whose minds God has opened, we have to make sure that we stay spiritually connected, connected closely to the Lord so that we don't become dull and spiritually insensitive. Right? Amen. Let's stand. <clears throat> Elam and Damascus and Edom and Ammon. All of these nations surrounding Israel, the Lord's bringing down. Look at the condition of those nations today. They're all enemies of Israel still. It's never stopped. They want Israel wiped off the face of the map. Boy, are they going to be surprised when Israel's not wiped off the face of the map. Boy, are they going to be surprised when Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom right in Jerusalem, right on that temple mount somewhere. I don't know exactly where, but it's going to be right in the vicinity of where I stood. Amazing, because that's what the Bible says. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the trustworthiness of the scriptures. We thank you, Lord God, that we have a sure word of prophecy whereby we would do very well to take heed. And Lord, we embrace this word as your word to us. And we thank you for it, Father. We pray, Lord God, that we would live our lives according to it. Lord, thank you for bringing all of the saints together tonight to study your word, to look into this, <laughs> these long chapters that we've been covering. Lord God, just... Thank you for salvation, Lord. Thank you for loving us, Lord, before we loved you and giving us the capacity to love you back. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys.